I'm Ted Carpenter, um, an anthropologist. Um, I um, became involved with Marshall uh, uh, for most most of uh, his life and my life for almost 40 years. And uh, we worked together. We uh, sort of raised our children in one another's kitchens and uh, we uh, published together and uh, we'd haunt the uh, uh, jazz clubs of Toronto and uh, uh, anyway that's that's the background when did you first meet Marshall McLuhan we, we met in 1948, in the fall of, of that year, and uh, immediately it took to one another. Um, I recall, uh, he was living at the time in, um, on the St. Michael's campus, and there was a, a Victorian house there, uh, a bit of a wreck, it had once been the infirmary for St. Mike's, and now they moved in the McLuhan family. Uh, and uh, there was a great wall around the place. Uh, anyway, he was standing in front of a fireplace with Corinne, and the two of them were extremely handsome, tall. She was very elegant, and he was just full of life. And he was quoting Joyce and Auden and headlines and poetry, and he'd break into song. And uh, it, it was a, one of the most amazing evenings I've ever had. Um, so we saw each other uh, almost daily. McLuhan was a literary scholar. You came from anthropology. What was the, the uh, intellectual meeting point for the two of you? Well, I, I think it's true. He uh, was a literary person, but at the same time, he recognized the uh, coming of the electronic age. Uh, and he was able to visualize what it would be like. It had not yet become what we now have. The, the speed with which we've moved into these forms is astonishing. I mean, it's not a question of Rip Van Winkle coming back. I mean, my, my father wouldn't understand this world. Can you talk a bit about what the media was like at that time and what's changed since then? Well, the, the first thing that struck, of course, was uh, television. In Canada, it was 1950. And then, uh, during the McCarthy period, uh, a fair number of uh, people fled from Hollywood and elsewhere. Uh, and you suddenly had LP records that were released and all kinds of music. Uh, and... Uh, the sudden competition of these forms. Uh, Canada at that time was, uh, at least Toronto, was a fairly depressing place. It's totally changed. But uh, people were mean. It was, it reminded me of Moscow. It was a depressing place. And uh, then suddenly people came from all over the world uh, and it was it became a, a, another place and you know uh, most breakthroughs come from people who uh, are on islands or isolated um, they're able to, from a distance to see the outline uh, the whole structure of a thing and they can then move in and take over. Uh, well, Canada played that role. Below was the United States, and you could see it. You could see what was happening. And 
in England, uh, nothing was happening. Uh, so we were literally watching the, the biggest light show ever, watching what was happening in the United States from Toronto. Through television or uh, radio? Radio was very good in, in, in CBC at that time. And, and the film board was doing all kinds of experiments. Um, and there was a, a certain excitement in the air. Uh, and the veterans had come back. Uh, you know, uh, I remember uh, uh, Northrop Fry once uh, said, uh, how do you teach a Milton to a class in heat? Well, uh, these veterans, had, some of them had been to hell and back, and no one needed to tell them uh, about hell. So it was a remarkable time. Why do you think that you and uh, Marshall McLuhan were so simpatico in the beginning? We, uh, we differed, and in certain commitments, but um, we got on handsomely. We, he was so much fun to be with. He, he could turn a phrase, and it was amazing the capacity. He was a, basically a poet. And, <coughs> excuse me, he could Simplify things, you'd be stunned by the brevity with which he could summarize something. And I used to think, oh my God, I've got to go write that down. And then he got on to the next one and the next one, and soon you'd forgotten all of these. It was an amazing conversation. Most of his colleagues shunned him. They didn't know quite what to make of him. At, um, Tom Easterbrook and he had grown up together Tom worshipped Marshall and uh, Jackie Turret came over from England and she had uh, a lot of style first rate mind um, and then when people would come to Toronto They'd look up this group, uh, Siegfried, Gideon, and uh, I, I remember once down here in New York with Walt Kelly, and Marshall and uh, 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 Walt Kelly were planning to do a musical together. It, uh, it, Ashley Montague would come up, and he would immediately head for this group. And we met uh, most days uh, about four o'clock uh, in, in the museum cafeteria. You get coffee for ten cents. It uh, and we stay until it was all over. I'd like to learn a little bit more about the the fun part. I've read a great story about you and Marshall riding on a streetcar in the uh, early days in Toronto. Can you tell that story? Well, uh, we were on a, a, a Toronto streetcar, and uh, they actually had a, a pot-bellied stoves, you know. In the, they, they put coal in the they heat the uh, cars. And it was this dour Canadian... Torontonian audience there sitting, you know, everybody looking down sort of thing. And McLuhan was uh, reading the ads out loud. And, <coughs> excuse me, there was one uh, that showed a, uh, a, a, a woman uh, on a beach looking up uh, quite... Uh, uh, fondly at a man uh, in a swimsuit who was standing over her and he was handing her a, a coke and McLuhan said uh, a 
coke sucker. And the whole group froze, sort of thing. And of course, that's exactly what it was. He, he hadn't made that up. Um, he, he had a way of getting to the point often. I remember once uh, there was a meeting with the administration at the university, and I blew up, lost my temper, and Marshall said, calm down. He said, we'll get our kudos from people we respect. And the president <laughs> looked at them. <laughs> anyway, it's, um, uh, I suppose we were not the most popular people on the campus. What was it about Toronto that was so restrictive in those days? I, uh, I don't know it, it, uh, whether we would dare even go into racial uh, factors, but it's, uh, it was not a fun city. You know, the, uh, the Irish got shipped to Australia, but it was the... Uh, the Irish who went to Canada were orange men, a pretty dour crowd. The, uh, but now all of that, that's so changed now that I don't think a young person would could even imagine what it was like then. Uh, all I know is that uh, he was a comet in my life. He was the most interesting thing uh, going in Toronto. It, uh, he was... Uh, well, I I'll tell you one story. We were in the uh, museum uh, coffee shop one day. Well, it was pouring rain outside. And um, uh, there's no one else there. But we looked up, and in the doorway... There was a stranger. He was uh, dripping wet, and he had under his arm a, a great scroll. And he came over and he uh, pointed a finger at us and said, Just the two I want to see. And he unrolled this scroll. And Marsha was smoking a cigar. And he took a, a pull on and blew out the smoke and said, Aha. Uh, Toronto's uh, William Blake, and uh, the man uh, rolled up that s uh, scroll and he said, uh, put out that cigar. He said, that cigar is uh, a product, uh, 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 no, I'm sorry. He said, that cigar is a product of mechanization, and Marshall looked at the cigar and took a deep pull on the thing and blew out the smoke and said, that cigar was hand-rolled along the thigh of a Tahitian maiden. And the man left. Anyway, I, I don't know how to phrase it diplomatically, but uh, Marshall had a, a seizure in 1957. And it, it changed his personality. It, uh, it reminded me of uh, uh, Conrad's uh, The End of the Tether, of the sailing captain who's going blind but is desperately trying to pr protect his daughter uh, to uh, make enough money to guarantee that she's protected and Marshall was a changed person after that stroke or seizure or whatever it was. He was a different person. There would be times when the old spirit would come back and so forth. But there were other times of chaos. And uh, it, it was quite sad. You cannot imagine how much fun he was in the early years. 
uh, he, he was full of life, the, the, just exuberance of the thing. He would, he would uh, intercept people on the, on the campus and uh, uh, 10,000 words. It would be like a fire hose in your face um, with all kinds of ideas and wit and fun. Anyway, he was a, a, a remarkable person. It, uh, one of the more interesting things, I think, uh, working with Marshall and others was uh, we weren't taken seriously, which is a, a great advantage. The, uh, if you're taken seriously, it's, it's like the New York Times. They, they think that uh, anything they print is going to uh, uh, be immediately uh, taken over by the government or assumed by the government and so forth, which is not true, of what, but they, they think so. So they say very little. It's interesting. Uh, the Globe and Mail, for example, has much better editorials uh, than the New York Times. And I, I think that because we were alone and because no one really was listening, it was possible to explore, to uh, get on with this thing. It was almost like a jazz combo where the, uh, a, a single instruments improvising and be outlandish statements that would be made because no one really cared. It was fun. It was just a performance there. And then good ideas did come out. But no one was worried about the exaggerated thing. Um, I, I haven't expressed that very well, but the moment you start to take yourself seriously and the moment your colleagues bring in a, a certain professionalism, it, uh, I, I remember one, uh, I was invited to give a lecture once uh, to the history club and I chose as uh, my topic, uh, uh, is history a thing of the past? Well, McLuhan loved it. And the, uh, uh, the historians did not. But the fact is, chronology is now an archaic form. Very few young people now understand the chronological sequence that marked the past. The... Uh, I would find it very difficult lecturing nowadays to uh, uh, university students precisely because they don't have and they don't need these forms. I'll give you just one example of this. The aspectual form is starting to come into the English language. Now, if you we have past, present, and future. The past is dead. The future is uncertain. And the present is fleeting. But we also have aspectual forms that are timeless. Uh, I swim. And it doesn't mean I am swimming or I will swim or I swam. It means I, I'm on a team. I swim whenever I can. Now, basically, science will use spectral forms because its laws are timeless. And religion will do the same thing. But now advertising is doing it. They don't want you to say, I bought this or I will buy this or I am now buying this. They want you as a buyer. And I think our language is moving very rapidly into almost a timeless form. It, um, and there are other big changes. One of these days we'll just wake up and we'll suddenly realize that 
the grammars that we're teaching people for, for English simply are not applicable. I gather that when you first went to the University of Toronto, the disciplines were very rigid? Well, uh, no, I, I think they're changing now, but uh, I'll give you one example. Um, I gave a paper once uh, on the case system in Eskimo before a linguistic uh, club, and um, it was, you know, received with indifference. Uh, but one uh, person came over. He was a classical scholar, a very famous one, a Loeb scholar, in fact. And uh, he said to McLuhan, um, tell me, do, do you think um, a film and other subjects will someday be taught in a university? He, and, and then he hastened to say, I, I don't ask that sarcastically. I, I just wondered. And McLuhan said, yes, he, he thought that likely. Very few classicists on our faculty nowadays. We have enormous communication departments. It's been that fast. For explorations, you had people from all sorts of disciplines. How did you uh, come to put that group together? Well, uh, we had this uh, seminar group with uh, McLuhan and Easterbrook and Turret and myself. And <coughs> excuse me. And I felt we weren't really getting anywhere. I, I felt that. Uh, uh, we had to put some of it down on paper and we had to bring in others uh, and so we started the journal uh, it uh, it had an influence that went way beyond uh, <laughs> the first printing was a thousand I think the maximum we went to was uh, three thousand uh, but the people that we reached with the right people, many of them. And uh, we printed uh, uh, articles there that uh, were, I think, of major significance. We printed, among other things, uh, the work of Dorothy Lee. Uh, if any one person, I think, influenced uh, that seminar, and influenced explorations, it would be Dorothy Lee. Um, her work has not been uh, widely accepted, but I think it will be. Uh, I, I think uh, there were forces at work that seem more important in the field of anthropology at the time. Um, for example, Franz Boas, uh, the leading figure here in New York City in anthropology, uh, put aside his researches into the origins of uh, culture and so forth to fight racism. He felt this was urgent. It was more important to do it now. And anthropology has turned uh, into a form of social work. Uh, which I, I think is, in a way, it's the right choice because racism did need to be fought. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm sorry it, it was seen as an alternative to getting back to some of these basic questions. So the work of, the, of McLuhan and others uh, at, at Toronto got pushed to one side, uh, taken over in part by the, the media people, but uh, n not as a form of exploration, not as a form of uh, trying to see in dialogue where this would take you. I'm uh, After uh, Marshall and I uh, 
uh, had worked together for some years. Um, I worked in film in uh, Los Angeles and then uh, uh, then moved to uh, join Marshall in uh, in uh, at Fordham University and that did not work out uh, he was not he was quite ill and I then went on uh, to work in New Guinea and from there uh, moved to uh, Basel where my wife and I stayed for eight years and then moved back and um, I've been uh, working in uh, uh, in the north um, just back uh, uh, last week or so from uh, Siberia in the north um, anyway that's the background what was the main focus for explorations? What did you want to investigate with it? Uh, we wanted to investigate uh, the media. And uh, uh, in the field of language, I, I believe that people speak as they think and think as they speak. And I think the bias of a language can be extremely important. This is the work of Benjamin Lee Worf and particularly Dorothy Lee. The media can also be important because every medium has its own bias, its own environment, its own reality. And... Uh, we occasionally understand that when a, a medium and a message get together, it can be a powerful statement. I, I, one that comes to mind is uh, Charles Darwin's uh, Origin of Species, and another is Karl Marx's uh, Das Kapital. Uh, this is a joining of a medium and a message with full force behind it. And sometimes we sense that when we see a great film, a truly great film. Uh, anyway, we were interested in that question. And it was never a, a question of, uh, uh, of the effect of, 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 of TV overcoming uh, other media. It was a, a, a question of essentially how to package an idea so it would have the full weight of, of uh, its format behind it. Now, uh, Explorations uh, was in many ways all over the place, uh, but we did focus on a core of ideas there, uh, and we had a lot of fun doing it. It, it, it was kind of a wild experiment. Uh, we would um, take uh, copies of it down and I put it on a, a, one of my children's sleds and uh, take it through the snow down to Bloor Street and there was a magazine store that sold them and I, I remember uh, at one point he said to me uh, no, he wanted a bigger markup and you know we're, we're, we're talking uh, I don't know uh, 25 cents or 30 cents or something and uh, there was another time when Marshall uh, read uh, Vincent Massey's uh, report on culture in Canada uh, I, I'm sure that book has been forgotten thank God for that but Marshall read it and regarded it as hilarious and he sat down and typed out, no, he wrote it in longhand. And I then typed it out on a museum uh, labeling typewriter with big typeface. And it was done as blast and bless. And this was his answer to uh, Massey's notion of culture. And he then, uh, we stapled these things together and he sold them for... 25 cents, uh, again, with the markup uh, at this Bloor store. 
I saw one uh, in the bookseller Horowitz there uh, last spring for $300. Uh, and I, I, I said to the Horowitz, whom I know, uh, you know, I typed that thing on a museum typewriter. And he, I, I'm sure he didn't believe me. He just, anyway. But it, it, there, there was a, a, a lot of fun in doing these things. It, um, there wasn't much fun elsewhere on the campus. It, uh, I mean, the gloom in the, the dark winters and, oh, sorry. <laughs> Was it unusual to have such a, a disparate group? I mean, someone from literature, yourself from anthropology. I guess Dorothy Lee was also from anthropology. And uh, J uh, Jacqueline Turret was town planning. Uh, yes, this was... Uh, but we had no difficulty in communicating. The, if there were, had ever been barriers, they certainly disappeared here. I remember there was one idea that came in. Uh, it was introduced by a, a psychologist named Williams, and he based it on uh, William Bott's uh, research. And it was called Acoustical Space, and Marshall immediately renamed it Acoustic Space. And that somehow liberated the thing, and it became an amazing idea. Of uh, The application in anthropology became, uh, to me, of primary importance. We suddenly realized that every culture defines a sensory profile. And uh, in, in, in native cultures, for example, they will, uh, to maximize... Um, uh, uh, sound, you'll minimize sight. So the dancer uh, is often blinded deliberately. Or you may find that uh, they will uh, deliberately uh, turn uh, sound into a textile thing. So they will plug their ears when they sing. Uh, if you begin to examine cultures, I think you'll find that all, all peoples do this. We, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we go into an art gallery and the sign says, do not touch. A concert go goer closes his eyes. We, uh, to maximize, uh, in, in, in a library, it says silence. And uh, you'll find that this will differ markedly from culture to culture. Uh, with Jacqueline Turret, uh, this uh, immediately brought to mind to her a fabled city in India, which was, in a sense, acoustic space, like a Frank Gehry uh, uh, building. And... Uh, the uh, uh, Tom Easterbrook got so interested in this, he shifted his uh, his research to uh, Africa and uh, the marketplace and so forth. And, and for Marshall, suddenly all kinds of things began to appear in terms of literature. The um, no. I, these ideas haven't uh, taken off in, in academia, but they certainly have in real life. A lot of people credit McLuhan exclusively uh, for many of these ideas, but what you're describing is really more like an interchange of ideas. Oh, it, it was like uh, Andy Warhol's factory. Uh, the ideas came whoever was present uh, people would be there and uh, 
a phrase would come out and boom, it would be taken and seized by everyone. Um, uh, we were stealing from any source. Uh, we, we felt uh, it was like Ezra Pound or T.S. Eliot uh, uh, composing their poetry out of uh, well-known lines. Uh, we, uh, I, I remember there were things that Marshall and I wrote together, and in one of them I alternated lines from uh, Dylan Thomas. And uh, the interesting thing was that no one recognized that. And it has been printed many times over when unsigned. Um, but uh, we, we felt uh, free to take anything. And did people not feel ownership over their own ideas? Uh, I, I don't think there was any uh, notion of... Uh, possession of this. Uh, uh, Ned Hall, for example, uh, uh, took uh, the idea of extending the, the media's extensions. And uh, Marshall took that over, but uh, uh, Ned had gotten it from uh, Bucky Fuller. And uh, these things simply snowballed. They uh, there, there was no real authorship. Uh, I did one book called uh, uh, They Became What They Beheld, but the idea comes from the Bible, from uh, Walt Whitman, uh, from William Blake, and uh, I've forgotten a, a fourth source. So... Uh, now, I think I've read that one iteration of that book uh, McLuhan had the credit for. Can you tell that story? Well, uh, uh, Marshall had a contract with a publisher, and uh, uh, he was, uh, at, at the time, uh, undergoing uh, surgery. Uh, and the publisher wanted to break the uh, contract. Um, but there was a signed contract, and so... Uh, I remember I sat down and uh, I spent a weekend doing it and I would go over to uh, uh, these uh, White Tower restaurants and, 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 and get fuel. And I, I just stayed there uh, two or three days, uh, night and day, typing this thing and uh, delivered the manuscript at, I think, 9 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning. So... Uh, uh, we uh, we felt free to uh, um, take any idea that was out there. And you delivered the manuscript in McLuhan's name? It was in his name. Yeah. But the, later I published it under my own name. And uh, there was... Uh, uh, again, there was... Uh, no, no problem in the traditional sense of ownership or priority or something. For one thing, who would have ever guessed there would have been any money in any of this? It, uh, and when money did come in, it didn't help. It, uh, uh, and then there was a celebrity status. Uh, I'm not sure what a celebrity is, but I, 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 I really think that celebrities are simply people who recognize other celebrities. And uh, when Marshall became a, a celebrity, uh, he was suddenly surrounded by... Uh, Oh, oh, people who did him no good. Um, and Marshall wrote one truly important book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. The other books um, sometimes contain good material. Uh, he wrote uh, Understanding Media uh, for... Uh, 
of all things, the de Defense Department uh, under Title VII. What was Title VII? Title VII was when, uh, uh, during the uh, Pentagon, uh, the uh, when the Pentagon t took over the, the Vietnamese War, and uh, I the the book was. Uh, a disaster. Uh, the uh, marshal was very sick at the time, to, to the point where they administered uh, the last rites. And uh, the book was denounced on the House of Congress by some congressman who said, you know, read long ex excerpts uh, into the congressional record. And they did sound pretty bad. Anyway, Marshall uh, wanted to take the book and uh, t turn it into what became Understanding Media. Uh, and we worked together on that. Uh, we would send the chapters back and forth. I still have... Talk about McLuhan's particular way of probing this aphoristic style. What's your thought on that? Where do you think that came from? Well, I, I, I think his spoken uh, uh, language was uh, far more concise than his written. Now, uh, people complain that he was uh, too abbreviated in, uh, in writing, but to encounter the man, and also with the emphasis and the gestures that he would put into it, uh, it was a performance. It, it was an extraordinary thing. It was something you just would not encounter. Um, and he could uh, capture an audience, or he could turn them right off. Um, I remember once uh, Suzanne Langer, who was a dry philosophy professor, uh, came to speak at uh, the uh, Trinity College. And uh, Marshall went. I was there. Um, the uh, chairman, um, uh, she read her speech. And then the chairman invited questions, and Marshall was instantly on his feet. And uh, he began to, he recited, I think, six nursery rhymes, and uh, each one a rebuttal to her. It was by far the most brilliant criticism I had ever heard, done as, as wit. I mean, this was, uh, this was Lewis Carroll. This was uh, just superb. And then he stuck his thumb in his mouth like little Jack Horner and walked out of the room. And the audience was frozen. Uh, uh, and the chairman apologized to Dr. Langer and so on. She never got the point. Never would she ever hear such clear criticism again. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll tell you one story that uh, occurred uh, r right at the beginning of uh, uh, my meeting with Marshall. Uh, we were both invited to give uh, lectures to some, I don't know what group, uh, some teacher group or something like that. And I gave a standard uh, talk, and then Marshall gave his non-standard talk. And uh, when we left, Marshall found out that one of his colleagues from the English department had immediately apologized to the audience for Marshall's performance. And Marshall blew up, and he said to me, I'm, there's, he said, there's going to be a faculty party tonight. And I'm going to walk in there, and I'm going to walk over and just slam him one. And Marshall was a big guy. And 
I thought, oh, Jesus, this is going to be rough. Anyway, it, Marshall cooled down, and he arrived late, and he walked in, and he was full of congratulations. He just heard that someone had won an award, a research award of $50,000 to study basic English. It wasn't true, of course. He just made this up. But he pretended he read this in the newspaper, and he realized that that was going to wreck that party because everybody, every person in that room would assume that his most hated enemy had gotten that grant. And then Marshall went home. Did McLuhan adopt this style because he liked to upset people, or was this a pedagogical strategy? I, I think he would bore stiff with people who weren't enjoying scholarship. You know, the, the academic world can be pretty, pretty bad. I mean, you have no idea how many people there are in in that field that are embittered. You know, they, they were attracted to the subject and they end up with a wife they don't love and a salary they can't live by and oh, colleagues they can't stand. That's really what a college is 80% like. Some people have said that some of McLuhan's ideas in the end were overhyped and in that way more easily discredited. Do you think that's true? Oh, oh, that's absolutely true. And uh, Marshall always exaggerated. He, he felt that it was an effective form. I think he's right. He, <coughs> he, he, he always went uh, for the maximum. Um, but in that sense, he was probably right. It seems there was a moment there in the 1960s, I guess, when it, uh, some of these ideas did start to percolate through into the mainstream, and then they seemed to die away, and, and so we are now where we are. Um, do you think that was a, a lost opportunity? Uh, it may be that uh, we're just getting on with other things. Uh, I think there's a possibility now that some of these ideas may come back. And, uh, well, for one thing is the failure of, of the of what was substituted. What are you going to do with Chomsky's ideas in language? They don't even make sense to him, apparently. And, and, and the notion that we all have the same wiring up here? Oh, please. And that all languages are identical? It's not so. There are some things you can say in certain languages that are, are more easily said in other languages. Far more so. There are languages that conjugate and decline from sing, uh, plural to singular. There are languages that have no tenses. There are, 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 are languages without adjectives. Uh, in, in many of these languages, you, you begin with a whole and you delimit the one. We begin with the one ourselves. And then we add a second, two. We say one and one make two. But suppose you were to say that from one, two can come. Which is true. And, no, I, I think... Chomsky's ideas uh, were acceptable because in 1946, just after the war, he was uh, uh, working with uh, uh, Zelig Harris, who had a big IBM, uh, uh, AT&T contract. And, and the question was uh, sending messages, uh, uh, maximum uh, 
circuits and so forth, uh, and deleting certain phonemes. Uh, arbitrarily, 25%, up to 25%, by selection, sometimes 50 or more percent. And uh, people were attracted to that and so forth. And then they, they kept promising we'd have uh, translators, uh, machine translation, foreign languages. We don't have those. And I don't think we ever will have them. You've described McLuhan as a, a shaman. What did you mean by that? Oh, well, I meant it in a very complimentary sense. Um, um, a performer. Um, real shamans that I've known, I don't mean the uh, new life style that they teach at the new school, but uh, real ones always reminded me of, of my dentist. The, um, uh, there's the costume and the assistant who lays out the uh, equipment and you negotiate the price sort of thing. And then uh, there's the performance. And um, Marshall was a shaman. He... Uh, he was a great performer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the worst came out of him generally in a, before an audience, especially an audience of critics. Once in a while, though, once I heard him give a lecture when we were at uh, Fordham University, that was superb. And there were no notes nothing. He had, them. it was an uh, advertising man, and he had them absolutely in his hand. Uh, he, he was saying to them that uh, they didn't even need a product. All they needed was the images and the hype. And uh, they understood that. Uh, you know, uh, again and again, you find nowadays that they sell the uh, sell the ad just before they manufacture the product, uh, and, and they manufacture it only if it's widely accepted. Um, well, Marshall was a performer there with the audience. He knew how to put on an audience, to clothe himself in that audience, to feed the audience back to itself. He's a master performer in small groups. He was a disastrous performer, generally in large groups. Some people say that McLuhan was on a kind of a quest to see the, the big picture of life. Do you agree with that? Do you think he was on a, on a quest? Oh, yes. I, I, but I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> I, I, believed, uh, I believed in McLuhan since the first day we met. And uh, believe me, I saw things that... Uh, I would prefer not to have seen, but uh, I still marvel at uh, the ideas, the, the, the gravity with which he could put something, turn that phrase around and then, you know, add crazy glue and mix this thing and then present it, wow. But uh, when he was uh, pushed, you know, uh, compare it to a, a jazz group. If a jazz group begins to really get with it, and then they can push way out to the edge. Some guy will perform there, and... He, 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 he may goof on the thing. Another person will move in and correct it and do this and that and build on it, so forth. 
But all you need is a negative group of, of players there, and nobody can work with them. Marshall would work with that. He, he was the, the absolute center of, of, of a group of people doing that. Um, and it, uh, I imagine uh, people who uh, uh, would sit in and listen to this would go back and repeat some outlandish thing they heard. But it wasn't outlandish in the context. It was often simply pushing things as far as they could go. And sometimes they'd go over. It didn't really matter. It, uh, and I, I certainly miss that. To me, that was the most exciting part of uh, uh, the acad academic life, to uh, just go in there and not really answer to anything except the, the group there. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, some of Marshall's colleagues uh, are pretty constipated types. They, uh, they didn't know how to handle him or handle him. Uh, they didn't know what to make of him. And they probably still don't. What do you think will be McLuhan's legacy in terms of the ideas? I mean, do you think there, there are ideas there that will stick over the long term? Dorothy Lee, uh, in one study, uh, compared linear and nonlinear codifications of reality. Marshall took that idea, <coughs> which is simple enough, you know, every story has a beginning, middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. And uh, at the time Dorothy wrote that article, linear was, as a word, was limited to science. Today, it's thanks to Marshall. Now, Dorothy wasn't too happy about that. She felt, oh, he just took an idea of mine and ran with it. But uh, it would remain unknown if he hadn't. Marshall was full of wonderful phrases. Uh, he loved to put things in, in reverse. Uh, he said uh, <coughs> that, uh, you know, in the land of the blind, a one-eyed uh, one man is king, and he said he's not a king. He's a hunted criminal. And um, he, the, the phrase... Uh, uh, that uh, something has outlived its usefulness. He said it's outlived its uselessness. And uh, uh, constantly changing these familiar phrases. You, you really had to listen carefully with him. It... Uh, anyway... I'll tell you one story about him. Marshall spent uh, the last part of his life uh, with us on Long Island. And uh, Tom came over, and Marshall at that time couldn't speak. Uh, all he could say was, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, but he understood, no question, he understood. He, and... So we were confining ourselves to telling jokes, and he was laughing at each one and so forth. And then uh, Tom had just brought out a, a really bad book uh, called From uh, Our House to Bar House. And <coughs> he uh, had argued that there was no real American design. 
And I said to him, there was a, a shaker table in the room, uh, not unlike this one. And uh, I said, but what about this? And the whole involvement of simplicity and, and, and beauty combined and, and the social amelioration and raising the, the this and that and so forth. And Marshall wanted to speak and his hands clenched like that and then he stood up and he just screamed. And then he got embarrassed and he smiled and laughed and went on down to walk along the beach. It must have been hell. I mean, to have something you... I mean, to, to Marshall, it would be like, you know, a fire or something. He wanted to, he, he wanted to introduce an idea. He couldn't bear to uh, wait. He would just interrupt and come in on something. But... Uh, he died not too long after that. 